All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is the podcast uh, a week after Necronomicon 2022. God help us all. Help us all. <laughs> we we all made it home safely. Some of us had have stories to tell about our way home. Um, some of us, I want to I want to show the Beastie Award on screen later. It's pretty cool. Um, and really honors Joe. He would love it. Um, why don't we do introductions real quick, and then let's just have some fun chat about 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 Necronomicon and about um, whatever John's latest books. We push them some more, etc. Uh, Pete, why don't you go? Good I'm job. Pete Rollick, so you don't have to. Um, I write the songs that make the whole world cry. I write songs that make the whole world cry. Right? Yes. At least I'm not wearing a Steamboat Classic shirt. Um, you couldn't even run the Steamboat. <laughs> I used to. But I can't even run, run the Steamboat. Trash talking in a contentious episode of the Lovecraft Easy. <laughs> All right. I'm Mike Davis. Bridget. Oh, gosh. That's my introduction. I'm Mike yeah. Davis. I follow that. Hey, I'm Bridget. Horror fan. Write music and make art. and. Yeah, fo follow you know, that. Bridget, try to I balance out all this gear. I want to ask you a question, Bridget. Oh, dear. What? Do you have one of these, Eric Zahn's? I do not. Those are pretty cool. Isn't that cool? Is that a Joe yeah. Brewer's original? It is a Joe Brewer's original. He was not at the show this year. No, he couldn't make it. His wife had some issues. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way that Mike is just like, do you have this, Bridget? I know, uh, right? Just I taunting me. There's, yeah. there's Rude. A, there's a reason <laughs> why I'm asking. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm asking if you have this Eric Zahn, because I'm going to send it to you. Aw. I don't have it either. Yeah, but she's, lie, a, but she's a musician. Me neither. Yeah, but okay, fine. She's okay. a musician. That's, that's <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm sending her that to her. I so. play the washboards. At least I wrote, I wrote an article on Eric Zahn, at least. That's, that's why I'm sending it. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I, I wrote an article, but it was the. He, he told a story. I did. I wrote a story about it the opera. Yeah. 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 John, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, and I, change the subject. <laughs> I'm John Langan. I was not at Necronomicon, so this is going to be painful and embarrassing for me. But other than Good. that, it's nice to see everybody. Good. Good. Uh, DeBronzo. Oh, my name is Mike DeBronzo. I just came back from Necronomicon, too. And what I learned from my visit was Narragansett. That is how you pronounce that word. Good. We all We all learned something. Your, your 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 mic volume is slightly low. You might want to get closer. Oh well. When you I want to know there, how how did you think it was pronounced? Nothing like that. I just <laughs> I, saw yeah, ours. I, but he was corrected by the waiter. By God. That's right. Oh, no, okay. I know. Yes. Oh yeah. And because there was a beer you wanted, right? Is that right? And or it, breakfast? And it was an Narragansett. Yeah. But I, I didn't call it that. Yeah. I don't know what it Can I have a Narragasu? <laughs> Or something like that. That, that pretty just, much sums it up, yeah. <laughs> and she's <DeBronzo>, like, <laughs> you're in New England. That's Gansett. Gansett. And there's absolutely no way that I can figure out to play that word in Scrabble. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Give it time. Rick, could you introduce yourself? Me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Rick Lay. I could attend Necronomicon because I had to attend another convention. That's right. Um, in which you received the Muncie Award. So, so, so for those who do not know, can you give us a quick rundown of that? It's uh, for betterment of the Pope community. It is sort of like the uh, award you received at the uh, Economicon. It is somewhat viewed unofficially as a lifetime achievement award, but technically it's not. It's uh, a lovely, I'll later show it to you. It's it's a lovely portrait of the shadow and the skeleton typing. In, in fact, I see it behind you. I, I will. Yeah, let, let's do this. Let's do this thing. So for, uh, I know that the majority are listen. So I'll, 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 let's all describe this when he pulls okay, it up. Okay, it's an empty screen with no people in it. Dramatic I think you just turn the light off or something. Yeah, turn the light off because it doesn't reflect well. Oh, good idea. 
It looks like Mike Davis. I, I oh myself. my God, that's a horrifying award. Okay, go back, go back, go back a couple steps. You know what? I'm I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna share a screen because I've got a picture of your award. Anyone see that? Yay. Oh, there you go. Very nice. So, yeah. That and is the, very cool. For those who cannot see that, uh, we, we have a picture on the screen of Rick uh, holding his Muncie Award. And it's like, like he's skeletal hands uh, about to type on a typewriter with flames, a flaming kind of creature coming out. It looks like the Phantom. It looks like... Uh, it's the shadow. It's, it's the yeah, shadow that's what area. I was going to say. It looks like the shadow. And it's sitting in a pool of blood. The original award was called the Lamont Award. And if that does not look sound good to you or look good to you, I I don't know what I don't know what's wrong with you. Seek professional help. <laughs> A little history on this. It was really called the Lamont Award. And the first recipient was Will Murray at the ripe age of 26. Nice. I can't imagine Will being 26. I thought Will is born an old man and it's just always been that way. <laughs> He's a really nice guy. So I don't mean it the wrong way. I just can't imagine. I just mean to disparage he, him in the nicest way possible. Exactly. Matt, you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, Good. I think I was plague ridden before I ever got to Necronomicon, but that's another story. Our prize this week is a hardcover copy of his own most fantastic creation, which is celebrating the sub 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 genre of lovecraft as a character edited by joshi it's got a nice author list if you want a chance at winning it send an email to easy prizes at gmail.com put hpl in the subject heading we'll draw a winner in about six weeks could be on its way to you all right now before we talk about necronomicon let's let let us speak of leaving necronomicon now, I have a story to tell, but it's not nearly as interesting as Pete's story. So, Pete, you you have the floor. All right. So, as a bit of background, um, Joe Bros weren't, wasn't there, but the Cryptocorium was. And my- Had some awesome stuff. They did. And my friend Sal picked up a- co uh, uh, Idol of the South Aqua. First mistake. And, and to make sure that he was it, cursed, that we got it home in you know proper condition, we wrapped it up in bunches of, of packing material and a shirt, and then buried it inside this the travel, the the carry on suitcase, and you know did everything we could to protect it. As we were going through TSA, they pulled his bag. So we stood there for 10 minutes while they finished testing some, some poor woman's entire case of, of uh, baby formula. To make sure that it wasn't actual, you know, not baby formula. Yeah. Uh, apparently baby formula is one of the things you can take on the plane. My Pepto-Bismol uh, got tested. Did it? On the way too. Oh. Anyway, so after that, you know, and so we're standing there for like 20 minutes and we could have gotten any TSA agent, but we got this one guy and um, he opens up the bag, he takes his shirt out, he unwraps the shirt, he unwraps the plastic wrap, he unwraps the bubble wrap, he unwraps the newspaper. He opens it up and he looks at what's so, in there. So you're saying he unwrapped it? He unwrapped it. Okay. But it was a big rigmarole. Wanted to be clear. And um, he unwraps it and he looks at it and he looks at us. And he looks back at the this thing and he says to us, is this Dagon? <laughs> and I like, no, it's the South Aqua. And he just looks at us, right? And then he holds up his two elbows and on one elbow is the elder sign, and the other other elbow is the yellow sign. And there's there's our we we, we thought no one would believe us, so we got pictures with this guy. Can you so see this on the screen, guys? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's Sal. 
on the right, and there's the TSA agent with the elder sign on one elbow, and the other picture. I'll show the other picture. Has the yellow sign. So he shows, he flashes us these two symbols, and we just start laughing our ass off. That's so great. I am literally just about doing everything I can to keep from rolling on the floor because we could have gotten any TSA agent. Right. <laughs> when I when I went through a few hours later, I I mentioned this to the agent, and he when he pulled out my uh, uh, award. And he goes, we're seeing a lot of these types of things today and yesterday. I'm like, yeah. I said, we're, we're, don't you have a TSA guy here with the yellow sign or something like that on his, uh, uh, on his arm? He goes, yeah, I, I know that guy. He's around here somewhere. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get to meet him. I was trying to. <laughs> so we we talked to this guy. And, you know, so we didn't get the pictures right then and there. We just we left and we just thought no one ever is ever going to believe us. And, you know, I had already started texting people about this story. And my wife is like, you're lying. There's no way you, you, this happened. And then just as she said that he walked by with his breakfast. So that's when we got the pictures because there was no way. And we talked to the guy. Uh, it turns out that he's actually been to Necronomicon. His brother was at Necronomicon that weekend. Um, and he, uh, he publishes comic books, um, Lovecraftian comic books. You tell him so, about the that? show. Yeah. 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 Tell him to watch the show. He, yeah. we're, we're talking about him. Yeah. I know. I told him that I, I gave him my card and all this stuff. And that's great. That's awesome. So yeah. I don't know. You know, I told him to get in touch with me and I would send him something because it was just the funniest thing ever. Yeah, that's that's only, a wonderful there's story. There's only two places that could happen in my mind Providence <laughs> and Portland. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it could happen in the San Diego, but you got a lower chance. Yeah. So, so anyway, that yeah, that was um, that was the highlight of that morning. Um, the for some reason our plane left thirty minutes late, and that cut our travel time through BWI to, from a comfortable forty five minutes to fifteen minutes. Oof. And did, uh, did they did you get on one of those drive around things? No, they don't do. You know, nobody does that anymore. They don't even know, call the I other know, right? terminal. Right. Mm -hmm. I hate flying. So we're running, we're running from C terminal to A terminal, and we get there just as they call boarding to our plane. And you know we wow. made it, and we actually arrived early in Palm Beach, but um, still, you know that was a, a little hairy. Wow, nothing like running through BWI. Well, my my plane, I I, I went from Providence to DC while I was in DC, just as I got into DC, my flight from dc to dallas was canceled not delayed canceled because it's been weeks and weeks and weeks of no rain where i live and suddenly it just pours out of the heavens and floods dallas so long story short i finally figured out found someone to get me on a later flight so that i, I got home but for a while there, didn't I thought I was going to have to spend the night in dc didn't something similar happen to cody didn't he get stuck in like newark for eight hours this necronomicon yeah oh I, I don't know i haven't heard that story yet yeah well, i'll have to check okay um all right uh bridget i said this before we started the show but i keep getting questions about why you don't have your cat ears i'm sorry <laughs> there it is that that I, there's, I can't say it any other way than that they were lost in the move Sure, we'll say that. I don't know because I've been uh, well, I'll trying to find know. all my stuff. <laughs> well, that that's a good excuse, actually. That's a good excuse. Um, all right, economic on Matt. Where the hell did Matt go? Jesus, what kind of a Mickey Mouse operation is this? What has he got? COVID or something? Uh, Pete, why don't you uh, start? Maybe summarize a little bit and then. DeBronzo, Bridget, Matt can do a little bit of summarizing too of, of Necronomicon. It, it, was, it was so much fun. I didn't go to one panel. That's not to disparage the panels, but I just, I, I loved hanging around everybody. Um, you know, I went to a couple of other things. It, it was great. So. 
So I went to a few panels. I went to all the panels I had to. Because you were on the panel. Because I was on the panels. I think I did uh, four or five panels. Um, I don't know. But Bridget, hi, Bridget. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Just making noise over here. <laughs> That's okay. That's your job. Um, we call it music. Well, there they are. <laughs> Whoa. Oh. Ouch. And, uh, you know, honestly, I people say that can she uh, put on the cat ears. That's what the noise was. Right. Thank yeah. you, Bridget. Oh, what's that so sweet? So everyone who was concerned, you don't have to be concerned anymore. All right, go ahead, Pete. Okay. So people thought I, I think people said that attendance was down a little from previous years, but I couldn't tell. Yeah, there was a bunch of people there. there were a lot of people there. There were um the dealer's room was a little was you know previous con of dealer's room was two rooms this time it was only one um it, there were a couple new book dealers but there were only one or two handful of used book dealers and there was not a lot of used books in the in the venue a lot of art like um, it was a it was a huge room though yeah you know, it was a big room really I, cool I, stuff there was a lot of cool stuff a lot of art uh, a lot of gaming, uh, pretty uh, pretty decent turnout. People spent a lot of money, and I was happy to see that. Um, panels were well were were well, well organized and thoughtful and diverse and well attended. Um, I had to you know, tr getting from one hotel to another for a panel was only taking should only take like eight minutes i found that i was accosted every time and that eight minute walk turned into 30 minutes because you know you have to stop and take pictures with people this that and the other thing um yeah yeah i get that so what was your favorite moment what was your favorite moments whatever all right so there this is a chain of events on friday I ran into Kurt Komoda, who did the art for the Necro Nom 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 Nomicon. And the I love sequel, that book. And the sequel book that's about alcoholic beverages. And I told him that I needed him to sign my copies. Um, and he said, yeah, sure. He's been by the dealer's room. So I didn't see him all, all day Saturday. Um, but on Saturday night, um, just on a whim, we went to uh, the black box bar and sat down at a table and he sat down right next to me and we had this long conversation. And then we went in to um, the theater next door and we watched a block of shorts from the HP Lovecraft Film Festival and one longer film, which I am not allowed to talk about. Oh, okay. Um, it is a fabulous piece of trash <laughs> that um we're not allowed to talk about and then after that so this is like 1 30 in the morning uh, a bunch of us were roaming the streets of providence looking for food and we found like this um pizza place that was open to two so we all sat and drank and ate bad street pizza at two o'clock in the morning um before finally retiring so then Sunday morning, the dealer's room opens at 10 and I'm only there briefly, but Kurt comes in and oh, it's like, oh, I have my books for, to, for you to sign. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no, give them to me. I'll, I'll bring them back to you. And he just disappears. Did you ever and get them back? Like, like five hours later, suddenly they're back. You know, I was at my panel and they, he dropped them off at the table. I opened them up and each one has a full page remark. A oh, how nice. Nice. And I'm like, yep, this is why I come. This is why we we have conversations and you know, so you remember when Necronom and Nom Nom came out? Yeah. When I bought my copy there, he drew a uh picture, uh a custom piece of art into my book. Yeah, that yeah. That's kind of like uh when I got the cat book, uh Jason Eckhart. A custom piece of art into my copy. Yep, won't happen anywhere else. 
Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, but your video is not on now. I don't figure they need to see an invalid. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I just like to but, imagine it's it's Adam West saying this. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, we have a, we have Adam West on the show today. That's Matt's that's right. avatar. Like, it's you know Adam West has been brutally beaten by Bane, and uh, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think the Batman Adam West could last with more than fifteen seconds with Bane. So. But there would have been a different yeah, no, you, you Bane. There would have been that an Adam Bane would West have to come into his universe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so all he would do is he'd pull out some Bane spray from his utility <laughs> belt. That would be the end of it. Bane's so, Bane. So Bane's, that's Bane's one spray. That's one story that I love. The other story is that you know, um, my friend and I didn't stay at the hotels. We stayed at an Airbnb, and our Airbnb happened to be in the building that the Strand was in. And the Strand is a, a is a nightclub that used to be a movie theater and the the legend is that that's where hp lovecraft once worked for a couple days but anyway um we were warned by the host that on thursdays and saturdays this this nightclub plays music till two o'clock in the morning so the the airbnb comes with headphones and earplugs so yeah thursday night the music starts at 10 and ends at two fine okay so friday morning we go downstairs and you're like if we're if we're gonna be here and have to listen to it we might as well know who's playing and it's method man and redmond and you know my wife is a big fan of these musicians so she was jealous she was jealous so you know yeah but hey uh something just occurred to me did I not have everybody introduce themselves? Did we go straight to the Necronomicon and talk? DeBronzo, yeah. did you? Yeah. Yeah, I well, did. You. Did you, Rick? Yes. Okay. Yeah. John did too. I, I apologize. I, I made I made like a mean comment. Oh, well, that gets that's good enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Sorry, my brain is fried. Uh anything else, Pete? Yeah, so okay, so after um after the Dunwich Horror Picture Show. I was, we were all supposed to go to bed because we had to be up in, you know, the flight was at seven o'clock, but, you know, I don't like to eat. The, I had dinner at like five and I, then there was nothing in the hotel, the, the Airbnb to eat. So at midnight, we're like, we should go out and get something. So we went to this food truck and then, you know, we're, we, we ran into um, Brian Thorwara, the, uh, the poet guest of honor and uh, Santiago Caruso the artist guest of honor nice and so we're sitting there at one o'clock in the morning on park benches outside of the uh the capitol building eating uh hot dogs and hamburgers and milkshakes with the meth heads now see the programming at necronomicon and at the hp lovecraft film festival in portland coming up in october i think the programming is always superb, but the moments that Pete are describing just just now, you know, the run-ins with people, conversations, and the books that he got signed, you know, uh, that's what that's what it's all about, you know, really, to me. Yeah, because yeah, people have to remember that you know, as, as much as I'm a pro, if you put that in quotation marks. Of what? Sorry. A pro, yeah. I, I'm really oh, just book, a, book writing. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's short for prostitute, yes. <laughs> which is legal in in Providence, by the way. You, that's the fifth yeah. goddamn time you this. told me Why? this. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I will not name the friend of ours at the Patreon dinner, um, who said something like, "Oh, prostitution is legal." Um, well, I know where I'm going after dinner, and his wife's sitting right next to him, going, "Uh, uh-uh. and I'm can I? I'm like, can I follow you around with a pen and paper and get romance tips? You know, yeah. I think actually you shouldn't question Pete's career choices. That's right. No, I shouldn't. I never do. Anyway, as much as I, you know, I am a, a you know, whatever a, prof- a a writer, I'm also a big fan at heart, and you know, yeah, I, I love getting stuff signed and and you know 
collecting stuff and th that makes me just as happy so this is from the vantage point um of someone who's been there before uh bridget and mike debronzo have not been there before bridget what were a couple of your favorite moments so not only was this my first time at necronomicon but it was my first time going to a convention where i knew a bunch of people that were going to be there i might have done been to a lot of comic cons and horror conventions and whatnot but not generally with a group of friends um so by far that was my favorite part but as far as the convention goes um i really only made it to one panel uh but got to meet a lot of people in the dealer's room um, and got to see uh, the HP Lovecraft Historical Society do their live radio performance. I got to see one of those, which was amazing. It was so fun to wow, see in person awesome. and having the audience uh, help out with the track, you know, and they'd tell us, okay, you know, make, uh, make busy people crowd noises and we we're all blah, 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 you know <laughs> so that was really cool to be able to to be a part of that um i personally thought the eldritch ball was amazing uh, i've been to a lot of different kinds of events like that and i just thought it was really well organized well put together people uh people were dancing <laughs> They weren't just standing awkwardly around the room. People dressed up. There were some incredible costumes. Uh, the music was uh, like 80s Euro pop techno, which was super fun. Um, the theme of Mask of the Red Death was cool. And they had really neat performances that were themed with that. They had a guy that was playing Prince Prospero that would come up and be, welcome to my ball. And um, it was, you know, I can't give away the conclusion, but it was well worth staying um when you're hanging out at an event like that that you know is going to be three hours and the time goes by really fast because it was paced really well it was you know half an hour ish of music performances half an hour of music performances um and then before you know it you know the big finale and then it's time to go you're like wow it's been three hours um you know to me that's that's a sign of a good event when you're just going with the flow of it and then enjoying yeah. it. It was, it was just the icing on the cake for me. That was super fun. Yeah. Um, what else you want? Anything else you want to talk about as a, as a new person mm -hmm. or anything else? Oh yeah. The, uh, the walking tour was neat. Um, and what was kind of fun is that Matt had organized this outdoor, uh, escape room a few days before which i'm sure he's probably going to talk about but what was neat is mike and i went on the my husband mike and i went on the tour on saturday the walking tour and we felt so smart because we'd, <laughs> we'd seen some of the places already during our uh escape room so that was cool but yeah just getting a tour from somebody who's really knowledgeable it's a beautiful city it, it it's really nice really especially neat. if you've never been you know you see all these all iconic um, sites that are important to the Lovecraftian and weird fishing community and and just and just Portland itself is so you know picturesque Providence. old Providence Pro Providence sorry I was thinking of uh, <laughs> yeah Providence it's so it's just an an older city it's picturesque and Jesus mm -hmm. built on what seven hills <laughs> yeah and our tour guide Rory he was uh he would did ghost tours in Providence for like 14 years and now he's living in salem and doing ghost tours up in salem which i want to go see one of his ghost tours up there now because he was a great guide and he just uh getting to do these tours during providence is just a fun thing for him to get to come back and do but it was fun to hear things from his perspective too so my friend sal he grew up in providence and his uncle and father and grandfather were all plumbers and electricians in Providence. So they know the city really, really well. Oh yeah, I bet. And we told his uncle where we were staying. He says, yeah, that's like one of the most haunted buildings in Providence. Like, oh, wow. Thanks. Great. Really? <laughs> well, well, you should have read Rory's like... book because Rory wrote the haunted Providence book. <laughs> nice. 
That's yeah. funny. Where where was that again, Pete? It's so it's the Strand Building, which is one. So there's it's on Washington. There's the um, there's the Biltmore, the Biltmore parking garage, and then the Strand Building. Yeah. Okay. You know, I and there was love, there was lovely... something else going on when we went by there one day. It was like uh, some kind of island party or something in the oh in yeah, well, the alley. Or... <laughs> yeah, the, the, I, there was a club in the back part of the building, like a, a Caribbean club, and they were like, oh okay, closed off the alleyway so they could throw a party. But I never saw more than four people there, like the whole weekend. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I wanted to post a picture with with your permission of, of you and Renmark at the ball, but I know you sent it, but I can't find it. So. Oh if, yeah, you can if, you can if, share if, it if you want me to share it. Sure. Where where are you sending it to? Uh, let's see. Um. Probably Messenger. Okay. Well, anything else you want to say, Bridget? Before we move on to Mike Garanzo? No, go ahead. DeBronzo, another first timer. Yes, this was my first time in Providence and Necronomicon, of course. I really had, it was really fun for me. Uh, I kind of have like my bullet points of what I wanted to hit. And I got to do those. There's a few panels. Like I got to see, I did the easing. Uh, I did the, the pastiche, which Pete was on. I also got to get see the ghouls uh, panel on Sunday, which is excellent. Oh, if I, if I can pause you for a moment, there's yeah, Bridget sure. <laughs> and Mike Brenmark. And there, Bridget has a claw for a hand, apparently. Yeah, I started making um, Bennett from the thing. Or Benning. Yeah. yeah, Benning from the thing. And so that was going to be his hand in like a Halloween display. And so I just thought, what the hell? I'll just take it with me to the ball. And it was great because we danced to like Tainted Loved and I had the hand up there like, burp, burp, and then people are. <laughs> cracking up about it. it was awesome that is awesome what mask is mike wearing uh he's wearing a plague doctor mask very nice <laughs> okay sorry debronzo go ahead no that's okay um yeah I, like we we were at the same dark adventure radio theater it was the first night so we got to see uh horror in the museum which was like bridget said it's just really cool you got a room full of people and you're seeing them up on stage switching characters and stuff it was just that was really neat i realized after like the first day though i got there thursday didn't meet anybody or do anything i kind of ate dinner and crashed but like friday you know you kind of get into the day we had breakfast and you realize you're not gonna like you guys have said this before there's no way you're gonna hit everything so yeah. it was kind of like i just made peace with that and go hey two years from now you go back and you do this so like bridget went on the walking tour and I didn't do that. I just kind of stuck with, I'm going to, I'll hit other stuff later. And I'm just going to have a good time. So it was really relaxed. And like the cities, it's not a gigantic city. It's a nice walkable scale and, you know, beautiful architecture. It was just, it was a fun experience. And we got to meet each other in person. We weren't, somebody put squares on a screen. <laughs> so, you know, it's just really great talking in person, having a couple beers, eating, and just it's a great experience from start to finish. I loved it. You know, we went to breakfast, etc. We had the Patreon dinner. Mm -hmm. Um, and I loved seeing you guys in the flesh, uh, Pete with Pete again. Um, but um I have to say that when I went up to Bridget or when I went up to Mike DeBronzo, I did not feel um Laird and I have discussed this that there isn't real life in the internet anymore it's just all all of it's just life you know and like right now i can't give de bronzo a hug but my point is that when i quote unquote met de bronzo and met bridget met her husband mike another mike for the first time i didn't feel like i was meeting him for the first time it felt just like yeah. a continuation you know so so I like how DeBronzo is like, oh, yeah, it's a really walkable city. <laughs> yeah. This is the year that they put the art show in the downtown area, as opposed to putting it up the hill at the actual art club. 
Mm. All right, Pete, you don't remember the first year, 2013. It was in three separate locations. Yeah. Including one that was on the top of Federal Hill. Right. Oh, Matt, I forgot oh, you were goodness. here. I, th I thought it was out in west. Hill. You had to turn yeah. around and walk three and a half miles the other way up frickin' Federal Hill. Yeah. See, you have to remember, I didn't go on that. I was in that part of town. Right. I was more so, down there. So, yeah, it was really walkable you, for me. You call it a walkable city. <laughs> Pete froze. There's a right. handrail so that you don't fall coming down. Years from now, I'll check that out. <laughs> so, yeah, I, the walking tour was, it was pretty brutal. <laughs> That's off the, all those hills. Yeah, it was right. One of them was right before our Patreon dinner, and Bridges Bridges texted me like, "I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it." I'm like, "We haven't even ordered appetizers yet. You're fine." I was like, "Okay, good," because yeah, I'm like, "We still have a ways to walk." You looked a little hot and need need of a cold drink when you arrived. It was worth it though. Yeah, I bet the, the they're they're I've I've been on them in the past. They're they're wonderful parking tours uh, uh you know i was kind of hoping in all honesty that i could bring uh, uh bring or buy a copy i think i have a digital copy not a regular copy either that or hasn't arrived in the mail yet ross said he'd send me one of corpse mouth and have john sign it did was there anybody there pushing your books this time john and they're going to Geez, you know, I, I mean, Derek Hussey was there from Hippocampus Press, and and I'd done a couple of books with him, yeah. and I did see, I did see some people were like, oh yeah, I got a copy of of one or both of those collections. Oh good. Uh, beyond that, I'm I'm not. I mean, I, I it sounds obnoxious to say. Well, he, I guess he published so, but, it, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ross published the 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 most recent stuff. So well, he was right uh, across from Pete and our tale. No, 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 that was Derek Hussey. Ross is the Ross published it. Oh, yeah, Ross, yeah, yeah. Ross, Ross, published, Ross published the the new ones. Derek did previous like older collections, oh, okay, so he was there with the older collections. But Ross was was not. Um, so I don't know if any of the the newer book dealers had any copies of of anything. Um, I saw I, uh, Sapira was there at. Yeah, yeah, that would have been that would have been Derek. Yeah, but I think that's the only thing I saw. Yeah, that's uh, uh, you know that's okay. I'll live with the disappointment, the bitterness. Uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, you're used to it. Yeah, yeah heaven knows. Actually, I have a couple of questions. Sure. So I was, um, what I was really, one of the things I was really looking forward to was getting to meet Santiago Caruso because he did the cover Illo for um, Safira and also for The Black right. Carnivorous Sky. And, um, uh, and I was actually going to interview him on Sunday morning. And then obviously I had to withdraw from that. And I made some suggestions about who they, uh, who they might pick, you know, to replace me, who did wind up interviewing him on Sunday morning. I do not know. Maybe Pete does. I was hung over. So. <laughs> I am ashamed of all of you. The artist guest of honor be. comes here from Argentina well, and, and you can't even give him the time of day. Pete gave him the him time, time of day. day. Oh, he gave him the time of night. Time of night. I gave yeah, him the yeah. time of night from like midnight to 2 a.m. He got up the next morning. You, Oh, my God. That's, you know. No, honestly, I don't think he got up the next morning. I think he stayed up. That's entirely oh possible. God. Oh, my God. Was that your only question? uh that was the big one i guess because he he had made these interesting he's he's done a couple of illustrated books one about the dunwich horror and, and so on and i'm i'm doing an introduction for him for one of them and one of oh, we were sort of chatting nice. briefly about about his time in providence and how um the providence that he painted for the stories was sort of a, a providence of the mind and i guess some internet research or whatever but now that he'd actually seen the place he really wanted to return uh, at some point in the not too distant future and almost do like a sort of residency there a little mini residency and just sketch and draw the place itself for for placing lovecraft stories and so i found that really uh i found that really kind of fascinating I, yeah I, but but none of you did so okay that's fine oh that's, i I, uh, I didn't know that i I do find, find what about Matt? Uh, was Matt? Did anyone get to talk to Matthew Jaffe? I keep. Oh, uh, thought you were gonna say Matthew Carpenter. I don't think. No, no, no. I don't see him. Oh. I didn't see him. Yeah, he was there, but but Matt's very shy and and uh, very sort of low key. So, but, yeah. uh, Well, before we move on, um, 
I want to keep pushing this every show because will you please tell the audience about corpse mouth now uh pete or excuse me uh paul was laid up with covid a few weeks back so he was restricted to his room had nothing but stale bread and 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 water the old water that his wife gave him uh and uh, a copy that she, of corpse that she, mouth. That she and, spat in yeah yeah she spat and in a, first, so. exactly and a copy of corpse mouth he had that she, too she really wanted to torture him she was like here this is all you can read and he was like no but he did have his 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 phone, so he tweeted uh, something about what a jerk you are because these stories are so great. So I uh, might Paul. That's yeah. typical Paul. Yeah, he's, he's so jealous. So jealous. You know, he's he's jealous of you, John. I don't think so. I think he's just uh, he just likes to abuse me. <laughs> well, okay. So just it, tell us about Course Mouth. It's your newest collection. I want more people to buy it. It is. Um... Oh, I happen to have a copy right here. How Do convenient. you now? Yeah. How right. Um, it uh, with a lovely cover illustration by by Matthew yeah. Jaffe. Look at that monster. That's corpse mouth. Um, it's a, a collection of stories. They're sort of autobiographically inflected. Um, in in a way, um, it it should kind of be read almost side by side with Children of the Fang the collection Mm -hmm. before that because i was writing all these stories at at sort of roughly the same time and i would sort of bounce back and forth and every now and again i would i would be like you know so i would someone would be like hey write a story about you know um ancient lovecraft or something and or or historical lovecraft i'm like okay fine and i would do that and then they would be like uh, and that would be you know invent largely invention right and then they would be like write a story for an anthology about dolls and i would be like oh my god i've got this crazy thing that happened when i was a kid and i would write about that so something crazy happened to you when you were a kid concerning dolls yeah i made my own godzilla doll oh why am i not surprised not german godzilla but uh, they didn't have, I mean, this was the 70s. They didn't have, um, or at least in upstate New York, you couldn't get a hold of a, of a Godzilla toy. So I took all of the old, uh, my old Star Trek figures. They were like the sort of eight inch ones um, and painted them green and took uh, tin foil and cardboard and, and sort of like transformed Captain Kirk into Godzilla. And this was the time when the Marvel comics had, had come out. Yeah, this two is year, totally legit. Go on. A, two, a two year run. And, um, and I would make like scenes from the, from the comic. Uh, like I would, I would get my mom to let me borrow a baking pan and I would line that with tinfoil and that was like the water. And then I would build, you know, the San Francisco bridge, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, and, and have Godzilla wrecking that. So, uh, so yeah. So, so some of the stories then I, I, you know, you're always drawing on your yourself, whether you think it, whether you realize it or not. But this time I was like, no, nah, I want to do it in a more self-conscious kind of way. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, I kind of think of the books like Children of the Fang is, is about um, kind of literary genealogy. But who are some writers that I've been influenced by or that I'm responding to? And there's some of that here too, obviously, but, but this is, is much more focused on, you know, sort of stories of my life or derived from my, from my life. So um, I think probably the longest story in it is, is Anchor, which you published first in, in Autumn Cthulhu. And um, which is sort of the secret history of my friendship with Laird Barron. Um, and that, uh, that, that novella, you know, whether you pick it up in Autumn Cthulhu or, you know, maybe do pick it up here, pick it up in cor- cor- Corpse Mouth. That's where it's at, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's it's sort of the heart of the. I, I pick it up there. Um, but regardless of where you do pick it up, that's in my top five novellas the of best ever it is just absolutely wonderful well, and i'm you. i'm not the only one who says that so it uh but yeah i don't know how to respond thank you um yeah. but uh i love your um, work seriously i don't know how to handle this sort of like like non-ironic emotion so i'm just gonna move <laughs> ahead. <laughs> just you know um but the other thing that, that there are a number of stories a couple of stories in here that that are sort of connected to the fishermen um uh not exactly no, that's, that's another reason that, that's a reason enough alone to buy it but there are a couple <laughs> of them um there are a couple of of stories um that that feature the the kind of demonic police force i guess you would say 
uh, from the uh, from the Black City and the uh, and the fishermen. And there's and the, it's funny. There's this this book also has a story. It's a very minor story in some ways, but that sort of brings together the fishermen in my first novel, House of Windows, and and uh, uh, ties it all together. Not exactly neatly, but so uh, so yeah. It's it's been. Uh, um, you know, with with Ross got uh, Roth, Ross got sick um, with with uh, a re- he was in the hospital for a month, um, oh and then there were supply chain issues. So the book we were like it was always going to come out. You know, it it uh, and uh, and it's finally out, and and people have been very gracious about it. They've they've really been been very lovely about it. And um, uh, Kelly Link gave it a, a lovely blurb. Uh, so did Ramsey Campbell, and and so did Glenn Hirschberg. And uh, I kind of like them as a sort of triangulation of of what I'm uh, of what I'm doing in the uh, in the book. Obviously, you you also everyone should be reading their work as as well. So so yeah, just it's it's kind of chugging along at the uh, at the moment. And uh, yeah, yeah, you can get it at Word Hoard. Word Hoard's website, excuse me. Word Hoard, yep, you can get it, uh, you know, with the the evil corporations, you know, yes. um, and uh, various small bookstores and, and what have you. Mouth. Um, yes. Also, uh, I just want to briefly mention that uh, Mr. Gaunt, which was out of print for ages and just damn near impossible to get a copy of Mr. Gaunt. I know I'm looking around to see if there's one close to it. Even that, I don't have a copy. Uh, uh, Ross did the world a favor and reprinted that. Well, it was either that or burn it. Um, um, and oh no, it so many people have been wanting it for so many years. No, uh, no kidding. Yeah, this is the new another another terrific Matthew Jaffe cover. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's just and sort that's of, a, excuse me. That's on Kindle now too, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll know, this, check while you oh, while you talk. I'll check. I guess, but uh, you know, this is my first. Cl- I was released late in two thousand eight. Um, we did like one print one run that sold out very quickly. We did a second print run that came pretty close to selling out. And I was like, hey, let's do a third and a fourth and whatever. And uh, the publisher was like, no, no, we're, we're done. And I was like, but it's still selling. And they were like, nah, then they just kind of lost interest. And I, I was like, you know, and they were like, well, you know, it'll be a collector's item now. And I was like, I don't want a collector's item. Well, like the, the, for- the money doesn't go to the author when it's a collector's <laughs> item. But it's, it's also just, I just like, like, um, so much of that just seems silly to me, you know, like, like I'm alive, you know, like, like yeah. anybody who wants to to send me an email or whatever and, and get me to sign a book or, or whatever, you know, no problem. Um, well, I just checked. It is on Kindle, um, $9.99. That's an extremely fair price. It's been out of print for just ages. So, you know, right after you listen to this podcast, you can get yourself a copy and start reading and you should. Well, the funny thing about it, you know, was was that it did wind up. I'm I'm lucky to to just future or any writers listening out there. I'm lucky in that these guys never they had no interest in doing uh, an ebook of it because if they were doing an ebook of it, I think they would still have the rights to it, and there would be no way I could have because they would have been able to claim they still had the book. That's a good point. So um, so yeah, I kind of lucked out, and that this was really before ebooks took off in the in the 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 2000 the, the teens so yeah we were able to get the rights back and and get a new cover design and um i wrote a new tiny story for it and um which i'm kind of pleased with but uh, i wanted to write actually this much longer story that was going to bookend the first story on school island and i just i just ran out of time and yeah. i was like okay i'm just going to write this teeny tiny little story that'll that'll and and in a way the I have to be honest, having like a book ended story also, I was like, maybe that's too like kind of neat. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't do that. Just write this weird thing at the end. So, so yeah, I did that. And um, uh, as we've said previously, I mean, I killed uh, Matt's, you know, retirement plan, you know, to just live off the revenue True. from the, the, you know, but that version is still must still be worth some money, you know? So uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. The other thing I'll, I guess the other thing I would say that I find kind of interesting is that the heart of, of this collection is this gigantic novella called Lao Kuan or the singularity. And it was kind of a riff on, uh, on a Saul Bellow novella actually called seize the day. And I, I wanted to write like a sort of horror story about this guy. Who's just um, kind of a loser and terrible things happen to him. And that's that it's, it's, there's a little bit more than that, but, and it just, people just hated it. They hated it with, <laughs> with a passion. They were just like, what is this? Um, and now 
I've had a few people who were like, you know, who are reading it in the new edition who are like, oh man, no, I really like this. This is good. And, and I think to a certain extent, I may be being a little vain here, but it's, it's like, I've got readers now who kind of get what I'm doing. And so when they read a story like that, they're like, oh, okay, I, I know how to take this. Um, it, it's something to think about, you know, if you're, if you're a writer or really any kind of artist and you know you do your stuff and and you know initially people are just like what the hell is this or they're like yeah you know that sometimes you just need the reading public to kind of catch up to you i mean there were writers that it yeah. seems you know click with their public right away um you know laird baron for example clicked with the public right away right but you know someone like paul tremblay um it took him uh, a number of novels to get to head full of ghosts and then when he did head full of ghosts then the public kind of everything clicked but you know he had a couple of detective novels he had a dystopian novel and i think now those detective novels have been uh, have been reprinted i think I can't remember if it's in an omnibus edition or if they've been reprinted separately. I suspect that his fans are probably going back to the detective novels and they're like, oh, look, what do you, I, I get what he was doing now. I, I understand that. So something just to sort of take heart, you know, that if your if your work, your early work or whatever you're doing isn't isn't connecting or, or doesn't seem to be connecting it it may just be a matter of time. Don't don't feel like I, I think sometimes people feel like, oh, my God, like. I didn't get any reviews, I'm done, or, or this book is done. No, it just it just needs, it may just be that it needs time. I think that not only is there a lot to that, it's almost everything to that. Um, that's bad phrasing. But the one thing, whatever endeavor you're in, trying to accomplish, whether it's writing, art, um, what whatever, it, it could be a million things that this is my goal, this is what I wanna do, this is who I wanna be. Um, you can fail and fail and fail, but the one thing you cannot do is give up. The quality of persistence is the number one quality that you need to have. I mean, yes, and talent, try and get better and better and better each time, uh, that's a given, but don't give up, just don't give up. Look at, think about your, uh, in, in the case of, of writers, think about your own to be read pile. Yes. I, uh, I just, the past couple of weeks, I was like, you know, I've never read Robert Marasco's Burnt Offerings, uh, which was published in the early 70s. And I've never read uh, Anne Rivers Sitton's The House Next Door, which was published in the 80s. And I finally sat down. I was like, I am going to read these. And I did. And they're great. They're terrific. They're brilliant. Um, like So like 50 years after the fact, I'm like, everybody should read Burnt Offerings. But that's kind of how it works. You know, yeah. I also... Um, I also got through uh, Rachel Harrison's Cackle, her her follow up to the Return, which is completely different from the Return. Also brilliant. Um, I'm not quite as behind on that, but oh, you know, nice look feet. at that. There, there we go. go. You can always get that's. I have the soft cover that looks always count on as, as the same. Uh, and and not only that, I watched the movie, uh, which I don't know if you should do or not. But you, can. I'm not sure that you should. It's, watch it's, the burnt uh, offerings movie you should watch you should read the book but then you should watch the movie because i feel like the movie sets some precedents for filming things like rose red yes and, and, the shining and, i, I, I think yeah, yeah. The, the book itself i mean the, King the shining the shining i don't want to get sued it's right the shining. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh the um king has admitted the influence of, of burnt offerings and it, it's definitely it's yeah. definitely there, but I agree that Dan Curtis's film, there's some more um, uh, visual overlaps to, to what Kubrick does. Um, well, you mentioned um, TBR piles, TB red piles, and how something can sit there for a long while. And you know, it's, it's easy. I, my TBR pile is on a shelf right above the TV monitor that you guys can't see here, but it, it's huge. And that's not even counting the ones that are in my in my Kindle to be read. So my memory isn't always the best, but I just pulled out this there, Corpse right. Mouth by John Langan and Ian it's Rogers. The edition, never read. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it's getting there. It's getting there. Um, Every House is Haunted, Ian Rogers. Um, he was, he, this is actually, this is another one that was very hard to find that was out of print. And this is going to come out again um, 
later this year. I'm not sure when. Cemetery Dance is doing that, I, I want to say, maybe, or, or... Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, Cemetery yeah. Dance. But um, also, one of the stories... Um, uh, I should have been more prepared for oh this. My God. One of the, one of the stories they're doing a movie of. Um, he in uh, who's the guy that directed? Um, and Night Shyamalan? No, it's it's Sam Raimi, isn't it? I think it's Sam Raimi. Thank you. Okay. It is. Or at least it, he's in, he's involved in it. Yeah, in yeah. So kudos to Ian Rogers and and I'm I'm lucky. I'm very lucky that I got. He sent me. This is the old copy that you can't get. And he sent me a copy and wrote a little note and signed it. So I tell you, some writers are very generous people. So I just realized that, all right, so one of the books that I brought up to get signed was Shock Totem 10, which has an interview between Catherine Grant and Paul Tremblay. And I wanted to get that signed. By both of them because they were both there and yeah, I'm realizing and by, by the way your little comment about i haven't read court's mouth i have read some of it okay <laughs> just not all of it yet. he's read the title by god Do you realize how many books people send me yes I, because you send me the overflow you get his sloppy uh, seconds no yeah. i get the ones that i know he'll like and i i that he'll actually really like and i brought my might not so that's what he gets don't let him fool you. He's frozen again, so we can talk about him. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent, Smithers. Hey, I brought Shock Totem up to get signed by All right, Paul. There he is. Cat Grant. Next Cat time, Grant. restart your computer, doofus. You're fine. Go ahead. Shock Totem. Shock Totem. There you Who were. You Who are you calling a doofus? Cat you, Grant on you, one side, you, Paul Tremblay on the doofus. other. They were both armed right. and ferocious. Yes, right? <laughs> And it was it was not amongst the bo the books in the boxes to get signed when Paul Tremblay came by. And I'm realizing now that I read that thing on the flight from BWI to Providence, and I left it in the back seat. <laughs> oh my god! Oh no! In the back of the seat, and like some poor person is going to pick up Shock Totem <laughs> and think that this is just like a normal book, <laughs> and. It's not. It's a terrible, terrible. I mean, it's a great, great book, but it's also a terrible book. But anyway. Yeah. I anyway, Shock Totem 10 is somewhere on Southwest. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> Making the rounds. Uh Matt, you want to say anything about Nakonomicon? And and I think that you would be, I don't know. Okay, well. Perhaps my issue was I got sick with COVID less than halfway through. So I missed a lot of the things I wanted to see. Right. But I want to comment on a couple of things that haven't been commented on. The first is the Armitage Symposium. Now, part of, quote, Lovecraftian scholarship is non-academic. That is, they don't have appointments at university scholars doing their own research and presenting their work in public which isn't exactly the same thing as academic peer review. But one thing about the Armitage Symposium is Niels is really well connected in academia because he's a scientist, damn it. Um, and he brings in speakers. So there was this one lecture, it was two speakers. Uh, one woman is an actual archeologist who specializes in underwater ruins and uh, the other speaker was a woman who works with NASA and JPL designing a mission to Europa. And this lecture was fascinating. These were both marvelous speakers. Um, and uh, one was talking about uh, a cult which rivaled Christianity in the first century and uh, how there's this one specific temple that uh, they were evaluating the symbols of it. It was really cool. But unfortunately, the next one that I had really wanted to go to, uh, I had to miss. But there were a couple times when they brought in these speakers uh, and 
they, they were just incredible. So the Armitage Symposium is another thing that those of you who want to do something different at Necronomicon, just look at the whole thing, go through the whole program, and you'll find that there are these uh, scientists coming in talking about state-of-the-art work. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, like everybody else, it was very nice seeing everybody and infecting them to the best of my ability. Um, but uh, there was a, uh, a company called Escape Rhode Island, and they said they had a Lovecraftian experience. This has nothing to do with Necronomicon. It's just in the same city. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll sign up for it. There are six slots. I think seven or eight of us went. Um, and it was a walking tour through Providence at Lovecraftian sites to do an eldritch ritual. So you get this, they handed us this briefcase that had like seven locked boxes in it or something like that. We had to go to different parks in Providence to figure out what the combinations were. On the plus side, it was a lot of fun trying to figure out the puzzles. On the minus side, it's they said, oh, less than two miles of walking are required. My ass. It was like two miles to the first place, maybe. And, and then we had to go straight up College Hill, like practically mountain climbing. You know, I swear to God, we would have been sticking pitons in the sidewalk. So that by the time we get to that final park by Brown University across from the John Hay, with that famous gate where there's that photograph of Lovecraft, we got to solve, solve the final puzzle. It was an unsolvable puzzle. <laughs> and we had to get a hint. And at any rate, like when we're finally supposedly doing the ritual or chanting or whatever, all of us are sprawled out on the ground dying because none of us brought water. <laughs> and then it's like three minutes to the opening ceremony, which I'd wanted to go to, but I'd been to it before and no one else had. I had to carry all the materials like, three quarters of a mile back to the place where we got them. And the guy said, did you have a good time? And I'm like, <laughs> all right. Okay. Um. But so there, there were lots of fun things. There are fun things I missed, but I'm glad to see what I got to see. Um, I'm sorry that you got COVID. I could tell you were suffering and then you went, you know, I knew you didn't want to infect anybody. You went through your room and stayed there. So, but I I really appreciate Matt that you took precautions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and Even, honestly, they were really happy I went to my room and didn't come out. Yeah, but honestly, you did the right thing, and nobody else in the group got sick. No, and so, and even at our Patreon dinner, which he left early, when he wasn't drinking or putting food in his mouth, he had a mask over his nose and 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 mouth so yeah he definitely was doing the right thing yep thanks matt because i was sitting right next to you <laughs> i was sitting across from him <laughs> all right so um listen why don't we talk about something else that's really fun um you know in the Necron necronomicon booklet um which i have in the other room because i'm not prepared obviously uh it, there is a very very touching um tribute to joe pulver uh if 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 you're watch this show you know who joe knock it off pete jesus um, it, <laughs> um it, it, everybody knows who joe pulver is and what he represented how he helped writers and promoted writers you know and especially new writers in a lot of ways um and um pete rollick wrote that I read that during the during the convention when I was sitting behind the vendor table with him, and it was just uh, it was very touching. So, if if you you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can read it sometime um, out loud on a podcast if Niels yeah. will allow us to do that. So, well, I I own that. So. Oh, you do not? Okay, you own the rights. I didn't get paid for it or anything. So, okay, yeah. Well, I, you know what? I know Niels. He wouldn't mind in the least. Yeah. So that that's something that we could do on just a you know and then put it on the on the Patreon playlist. You want to you want to do that soon? Yeah, I'll I'll do that sometime. I'll I'll do a recording sometime and see see what it sounds like. We might need somebody with a better voice. Yeah, your your voice is great. Um who who wants to start off talking about the Pulver Award? Um now I just thought this was so 
great that they actually created a, a Joseph S. Pulver Award, you know, nicknamed the Beastie. Uh, if you're watching, you can see it on the screen. If you're not watching, Can I tell you, Mike, that I think Nick Gucker helped with the design. Yes, and gave it to Joe Brars, who did the sculpt. That that's a, that's exactly right. So they were both involved in creating it. Uh, who wants to? Can you guys see this on the screen? Yes. Okay. Who wants to describe this better than I can? Well, don't uh, all jump jump in at once. This is a mass of tentacles, which eventually, you know, at the base, uh, which eventually reveals itself to be a enrobed figure with a great, you know, flared collar with a yellow sign symbol at the throat. The face is. I missed huge. that. Wow, what? cool. I missed the yellow sign. Oh, yeah, me too. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Um, the face is clearly that of um, of Joe Pulver with in full um, walrus mustache and beard. <laughs> um, in his right hand, extended out, he clutches a pallid mask. Yes. Uh, with eyes and a, a, a rudimentary nose, a hollow cheeks, but no mouth. You know why? Because he wears no mask. That's right. That's why it's not on his face. That's right. That's right. And then, um, kind of uh, on what would on one of the tentacles, he clutches the head in his other hand, a, a skull mm -hmm. with lacking a jaw. Um, it, it's beautiful. It's done in a bronze patina, maybe. Um, very, very cool. The winners were Terry Clark, who writes under, I, I, I don't, I keep trying to remember the name that she writes under. Zen, Zen Rockland. Zen Rockland. Uh, but it's sort of, uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, everybody knows. So, you know, even I saw on LinkedIn, I won the Joseph F. Pulver Award. She said this under her real name, Terry Clark. Um, so, and um, I haven't got to her work yet, but I'm sure she deserves it. And I have read Craig Lawrence Gidney, the other recipient uh, who we've had on the show once. And he, he was the other recipient. There were, there were two recipients to the Joseph S. Pulver Award. Yeah, it's because it was two years. Yeah. Um, Economicon happens every other year. So, you know. On the uh, statue itself, are the tentacles flowing from under the robe? Uh, no, no, I think I, they flow no. up and over it. Yeah, over it's it. More like the, he's emerging from the tentacles. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, the reason why they created this award. Um, anyone want to explain this better than me? Maybe Matt Carpenter. Um, it's really to help recognize and promote someone who's young in their career and showing a lot of promise. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it's not Lovecraftian fiction. It's weird fiction. It's uh, mm -hmm. Eldritch. It's unusual. Um, and <laughs> so it's really trying to do what Joe did, which is, find new artists who are worthy of uh let's look at them now at this phase of their career and see what they can become later too yeah he was always talking to everybody me included about how publishing used to be very loyal to an author and you know they would stick with them and build them up and build them up and build them up i'm saying it uh, i'm way worse than joe did but that's what Joe would do. He would build up new writers and encourage them. So he uh, always yes. He always said that a writer needs encouragement. And that the best thing that a writer can hear is that he loves the story. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Joe did. I, I'm just he was my friend. He was all of our friends. Um uh and I'm just really glad that they created this. It, you know, kudos to Niels and and also kudos to um, to Nick Gucker and to uh, Joe Boris who yeah. created this. They're both extremely talented artists. 
Um, also, um, let's see. Um, Derek Hussey won the uh, block award. So that's good. And somebody else did also. Yeah, who else won that block award? I don't know. I don't know. It was, uh, was it Mike DeBronzo? It was DeBronzo. It was that young line. Oh, wait. No, it was, it was another Mike. There you go. Could that, there you go. Just put my name over there. <laughs> Just scratch out Davis with <laughs> DeBronzo. <laughs> <laughs> we actually got at the dinner, we got to hold this. Got passed yeah. around the table. Yeah, because at the, what was that? The guest, um, I don't remember what it's called, but it, it was dark. We were outside on the third floor. I, it, I, I'm afraid you can't open it. I, I did try. I didn't mean to crack it, Mike. But <laughs> yeah, he, he really, banged it on the really table a couple of times just to see no what would happen. Compartment, so. That released the COVID. That was what happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened, yeah. Anyway, it says the Robert Blocker Board, Mike Davis, Necronomicon Providence 2022. And um, I'll paraphrase they made me they made me talk when they gave it to me and i'll i'll just say very quickly that i truly appreciate this i'm i'm not sure why i got it but thank you and um i i guess it's an award you know for helping to build up the community which previous recipients have done um Derek Hussey certainly has done with his, his press he's published a lot of writers and uh, I've, I've tried to promote writers just as much as I can. Um, when Niels told me that I was, he goes, I might as well tell you you're getting this. It, it was like a bolt from the blue. It was nothing I ever expected to get, you know? And uh, <laughs> my first question was, Dylan Niels was, what? Why? You know? <laughs> so, um, but my, my, acceptance speech was that I, I talked about um, a business owner, uh, legendary business, a man who, whose name escapes me at the time, at right now, but I remembered it then. And when he hired people to head up a new office or similar positions, people that were going to be people of authority, David Ogilvy, that's his name, uh, people in authority in his company, he would give them a Russian doll. And if they were curious enough later to open the Russian doll, of course, they found another one, smaller Russian doll. You know, that's how the Russian dolls work. And again, and again, and again. And if they were curious enough, curious enough to get to the, to the bottom, the very smallest Russian doll and open it, there was a note in it. And the note said that, I think I can do this from memory, if, if we hire people who are smaller than we are, we will become a company of dwarfs. If we hire people who are bigger than we are, then we will become a company of giants. And what I said was that 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 applied to, to so much more than just business. And my point with that is is that I'm very lucky to have the people that I have around me. Uh, you know, I was talking about you guys. Yeah. Um, I was talking about the patrons, I'm, and I'm talking about everyone who has helped me these last 11 years to you know to you know they've spread the word or they've encouraged me or they've sent me 10 bucks because you know i don't make much doing this or or whatever um you know and and especially the patrons and especially you guys and I, did, I, so. I would say peter dinklage wants to have a few words about your choices of analogies but uh yeah i you know what after i gave that speech i i realized that maybe that's not the most PC I was just reading, but I think the point is if we hire people who, you know, a lot of, a lot of executives, they don't want to be shown up, you know? Um, so they hire people who maybe aren't as bright as them or aren't, won't be as good at their job. They don't want to hire people that are going to outshine them. And to me on this podcast, people like you, Matt, Rick, Pete, Bridget, DeBronzo and everyone that's been on this podcast, Joe included, everybody. I didn't name the... <laughs> what? Bridget in the, the comments. What did she say? Call, said, me a, 
Call me Call an me elf. An elf. Well, one, one more time. <laughs> one more time. Uh, you know, you just, I mean, they know so much more than I do. And, and they, what they bring to the show is so much. John, I know you can't make it every time, but every time you do, I'm grateful. Every so, time I do, I bring the level down that much more. <laughs> Well, that's what we're we're shooting for, John. So, <laughs> anyway, yes. Um, thank you very much. Now let's talk about somebody besides. Can me. I can I talk a little bit about Derek Hussey? Please do. Um. Okay. So it's not the reason he would get this award isn't just because so many years of publishing Hippocampus Press and supporting Lovecraftian scholarship and history and whatever. What you may not know is he has personally set up scholarships. Uh, one, it, and I don't know where the other two are, but one is at the John Hay Library where someone gets, uh, it's a modest stipend, a few thousand dollars to spend a summer or 10 weeks doing Lovecraftian scholarship. But he's I did not early, know that. That's amazing. But he's also done the same thing for Clark Ashton Smith and Robert E. Howard. They're small to try and produce modern scholarship in an actual academic setting for these weird tales authors that we love so much but he did more than that from his own personal money when caitlin kiernan was living in providence he provided the money for her to donate all of her early papers and works and manuscripts to the john hay library where they, they will be appropriately curated and available for interested scholars later down the pike so it's not just that he's running this press which is reason enough to do it he's also done other things that i did not know that matt thank you so much for pointing that out um yeah he he totally deserved that award um in fact i remember when niels was on me and you and bridget i think it was talking about the upcoming necronomicon and it was it was more or less a secret that i was getting it derek was getting it um the block award i mean and you were like, I'd love to shoot out some suggestions. Like you, you, you shot out a couple names, and then you said, "And Derek Hussey, you know, he should get it sometime." And I was just laughing to myself because I already knew that Derek was getting it. So, but you're you're absolutely right. So, so anyway, thank you to everyone. Um, thanks for the last eleven years. That's all I can I can say. You know. Um, uh, what else do I have on the agenda here? Oh, yes. Um, all right. So did I miss anyone talking about Necromicon before I go on? I don't think so. Um, Alan Baxter has a, has a new book out and it's called, um, Sallow Bend. Uh, if I can find it. Yes, here it is. It's called Salon, Salo Bend, S-A-L-L-O-W, two words, B-E-N-D. Um, you can get it on his website or, or excuse me, um, not sure where you get it. Oh, yeah, you can, yeah, there's links on his website, alanbaxteronline.com, or just Google Salo, Salo Bend Alan Baxter. Anyway, I'm not at liberty to say what happened, uh, I don't believe. But this was the book, a book that was supposed to be, it, there was going to be a lot of coverage of this book. Um, and that's probably the only thing I can say about it. And I don't know if it was anyone's fault. I don't think it was. Um, what's that, Matt? Is that, did it, does he talk about that? Oh, you, you linked to the book. Okay. Anyway, I don't believe it was anybody's fault, but whatever happened, but Alan was very, very, uh, and still is, down about the fact that this big opportunity didn't happen. So I guess I said all that to say this. I really I want to do my part to make sure that everybody who listens to my podcast knows about this book and picks it up. It's, it's available already. Thank you, Matt, for the link on, on Amazon as well. You can get it in paperback or on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited. You got Kindle Unlimited, grab it. Um, One thing I noticed about the little blurb, yes. which really intrigues me, is I love a creepy carnival story. Yeah. 
and it's set in a time of a carnival, which is really cool. Uh, that's very true. And I'll just read the synopsis because it, I haven't gotten to it yet. Don't laugh at me, Pete, but I, I want, I, I read a lot of Alan's books. I have, and he just gets better and better. Uh, so the synopsis is something old and deadly has, aw has awoken. When two teenagers go missing from the small rural town of Sallow Bend, the residents come together to search for them. Little do they suspect that finding the wayward girls will be the start of their problems. An old evil is rising, and only one man seems to realize that everyone is in danger, and this is not the first time it's happened. With the carnival in town, people want to have a good time, but for many, this will be the first time of their lives. Uh, he has blurbs from guys like Laird Barron, Paul Trimbley, Christopher Golden. Um, please, if you've never read Alan before, please pick up this book and read it. Uh, again, I can't really say what happened. Maybe Alan can say in the future, but it depressed the hell out of him. I, I, I can say that. And if it happened to me, it would depress me too. What is the title of the book? The title is Sallow Bend. S-A-L-L-O-W-B-E-N-D, two words, by Alan Baxter, B-A-X-T-E-R. Um, in fact, I'm, I, I'm not going, I'm not, I don't want to think you guys to think going, going too crazy with the uh, screen shares, but let's put it on the screen here. So there it is, Kindle Unlimited um, paperback. Uh, if you don't have Kindle Unlimited, it's only two ninety nine. So, please buy it. Please read it. Um, so, I guess that's all I can say about that. Yeah, I, I would just like to chip in. I haven't yes, read Sal Sallow Bend. It's it's. I'm um, just got the email from Cemetery Dance saying my copy is on its way. Right. But Alan is a he's a fabulous writer, um, and he does. You know, his early novels were were kind of um, sort of like like horror slash urban fantasy. Or Alan's a, a very accomplished martial artist. He's, he's he has his own kung fu studio, and um, so they were they were action novels, but in which the action was written by somebody who understands, like like Laird, I guess, who understands how to write action, you know. And, and, right. Um, and so, if that's your thing, you can check those out. His his later work, he has some uh, a couple of fantastic collections of short stories. Um, I'm trying to remember is the one crow shine or something like that. Uh, yeah. Crow shine. Great, uh, yeah. And, and the stories in there are just, there's just this amazing range of talent. The guy has, he's written a couple of um, a couple of novels about a place called the gulp. Uh, I actually I shouldn't say that a couple of books um, is it the fall in the gulp, I think. And they're both collections of like five novellas about this particular place. Um, on top of that, he wrote a novel about a homicidal kangaroo uh called the rue which i think started off as like a sort of a joke thing and then he was like what the hell and oh he come this... on john <laughs> everybody writes homicidal kangaroo novels i don't know well he was the one who started <laughs> it right back then it was like crikey who could do such a thing and uh then alan was like i'll show you mate and uh he did <laughs> so uh the Crocodile Dundee of Australian horror. No, 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 no. But if, uh, yeah, Alan is, is, is the real deal. He's the, there are a number of, of incredibly talented writers, Australian horror writers, um, uh, Karen Warren, obviously, J. Ashley Smith, uh, uh, Angela Slatter, and uh, Jenny Brucolar, and, uh, and Alan as, as well. There's, there's really um, uh, a lot of really heavy hitters uh, down under. And uh, and Alan yeah. hits hits as hard as any of them. So I, I recommend, you know, uh, if, if you're not familiar with his work, uh, this is the time to, to make yourself acquainted. And, and if you like somebody who's who's um, trying, you know, constantly sort of challenging themselves as a writer and, and trying and succeeding at new stuff, Alan is is absolutely the way to go. And, and you know, so many horror readers love small town horror. Uh, and Alan is really a master of it. You yeah. know, the, the Gulp, for example, uh, um, sm is small town horror. And Silo Ben, this new one that we're talking about, is small town horror. So I I've promoted a lot of books. We've promoted a lot of books on this podcast. But Alan didn't deserve what happened. Um, and 
he was really let down. I don't. I think it was just circumstances. I don't know. But what I'm going to say is something I've never said before. I'm begging you to read this, to buy this book, whether you read it on Kindle or you get the paperback. Please do that. You're not going to be disappointed in the story. Um, and you, if you've never read Alan before, you're going to be introduced to an author who, as John said so eloquently, is a writer that you need to read all of his work. So. No, let's stick with the Crocodile Dundee of Australian horror <laughs> literature. I think he'll like that. I, yeah, I feel, yeah, there you I feel go. absolutely sure. Or possibly Mad Max. I'm not sure which. Uh, I just think when he listens to this, he's going to be happy to hear John Lang singing his praises. So. No, he's going to be like, murder him. All right. Someone else we need to help uh, before we go uh, and get the word out is uh, Michael Kelly, Undertow. John, are you familiar with this? Yeah, Michael's run into some uh, some difficulties because of, of um, the same supply chain issues, actually, I was talking about with my book. They've affected him, and, and particularly they've affected um, the magazine that he does, uh, Weird Horror, the biannual magazine. And... Um, and he was uh, he was saying that, you know, he was really had run into the um, into the red and uh, said, it's totally my fault, which I think is in, in a that's, sense that's, is that's not bullshit. really it's not. it's not really fair because I think publishing just, is hard, man. It's hard. And just circumstances happened that he had no control over. So yeah. he was um, he was discounting his uh, entire line of ebooks. I want to say, I think everything was two bucks. Um, and the thing is that, that as Bridget what, pointed out, they're usually fourteen ninety nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the thing is, man, I, I mean, he has just been. It's like Babe Ruth at the plate. You know, every time he steps up to the plate with a new publication, it's a home run. I mean, he had Mary Rickard's last novel. Uh, he's had collections by um, K. Cronister, uh, A. C. Weiss's collection, which is astonishing. Uh, Steve Tose. Uh, Laura Morrow. He's, uh, I think he is uh, Cassandra Kaw's, uh new collection as as well. And he's oh, had some, good. yeah, yeah. He's had some crazy collect, uh, crazy novellas. Um, Nahan Ruthen's uh, Help Me, and uh, there's another one, a brand new one whose name I'm I'm just spacing on. But you know, it, it's it's really, I, I kind of feel that he's really hit his stride and his press has really hit his stride the, the last several years. So, you know, it, it's almost a guaranteed every time something comes out from him, whether I've, I know the writer or not, it's like, this is going to be good because, because I trust his taste. Um, and he wanted to, you know, he wanted to revive uh, a sort of print horror publication. Obviously there's, there's an E version of it as, as well. And that's, uh, that's what weird horror is. So, you know, the thing is, um, I kind of feel like with with things like weird horror or or whatever, these are always things that we like we moan about them after they're gone. Oh my god, it's so terrible that that collapsed, yeah. or oh my god, it's so terrible that this press collapsed or that press collapsed. And you know, sometimes it's the press's own fault, but so often it's it's just we're like, oh yeah, got to get around to buying that. Well, you know, buy it. You know, especially yeah. for two two bucks, go nuts. You know, for, for 20 bucks, you get 10 books. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that'll, you absolutely. know, why not? Why not just do that? And and who cares if it takes you 10 years to read them? That doesn't matter. You'll get to them eventually. Or this won't. press, this press, John, is the, is the real fucking deal. Like you said, every time he steps up to the plate, whether it's Weird Magazine, his magazine or or his books, yeah. they're all fantastic. This is not a press that we as a community can allow to go under. That's just, that's it right there. Yeah, I, th I think, here's the thing. I, I think as we get older, you know, you got to put your money where your mouth is. And that yes. doesn't, what, what, and the thing is in this case, that doesn't mean, you know, oh my God, we need thousands of dollars. It's no. two, two bucks. You know, yeah. I, I mean, that is actually less than the, the amount I'm going to spend on my coffee at Dunkin' Donuts tomorrow. So right. if I can afford that, surely I can kick in a little bit to, to Mike Kelly. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have a link um, on the, in the show notes, whatever version you're listening to or watching this on. Um, I'll have a link to Michael's, um, uh, you know, explanation of what's going on. Uh, as John said, he's blaming himself a bit, but I you know, I am, he's a small press independent publisher. I'm a small, small, small press publisher. Um, so 
you know, I have some idea of how hard it is. And, and we, it's just too good of a press to let go on. My point is that I've, I got a link in the show notes to where you can purchase these eBooks um, at this discounted price. You can also, uh, uh, there's a, a link that says make a one-time $5 donation. You know, it's the buy a coffee thing. Um, I, I bought quote unquote two coffees for them and um, whatever magazines I don't have, I'm going to get in on those too. So that link will be on the show notes. It'll be just that easy for you. So, you know, please do that. The, 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 Alan Baxter and Michael Kelly with Undertow Publications, these are two people that we want to see keep going. And one thing I know about this community is that we help each other um, w- when it's needed. So the rest of the time we tear each other down mercilessly. Let's get right. on to that part of the show. That's right. And uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to wrap up. But speaking Damn of <laughs> speaking of mo- money, you can spend. Uh, Trevor Henderson, the found footage artist, uh, siren head artist guy. Uh, he's a friend and he did this for me. This is a coffee cup. It says it's got Cthulhu at the top and says Lovecraft Easy Podcast. Uh, you can put it on a t-shirt um, or or whatever. It's really cool. And this is all of us like underneath? I think so. Those, those, okay. I, those eyes and everything. I yeah, see one with, with cat ears. So, By God, you're right. <laughs> anyway, I love it, especially as a coffee cup. So I am do have Patreon. I realize we're asking you to spend a lot of money today, but Patreon too is less than the than, than the uh, price of a cafe mocha, so five dollars a month. Matt, your price? Yes. Yeah, so for absolutely zero dollars, <laughs> you can enter our drawing for a lovely hardcover book from PS Publishing. It's not the signed version, sorry. Uh, it's his own most fantastic creation, edited by S. T. Joshi. Stories that feature HPL as a character. If you want to win it, um, send an email to easyandprizes at gmail.com. Put HPL in the subject heading and we'll draw a winner in like six, seven weeks and it could be you. Yeah. Easyandprizes at gmail.com. Not, not my email address. So um, did we miss anything, guys? Anything to say before we close? Good to see you, John. I was hoping to see you at Necronomicon, so I'm glad to see you today. I was too, you know, and, and just, I, I thought um, the Patreon dinner, I thought that was a lovely idea. I, I really just, I didn't, I didn't know you guys were going to do that. And I, I just thought that was, that was such a wonderful thing. Uh, especially since that way, Matt could infect everybody like in one oh, yeah. super spreader event. I thought in fact, that was, was the only reason that we did it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You were just like, all right, here you go, Carpenter. So uh, there's a little backstory to that. Like, Two Pete, weeks. Pete always helps me with the patron dinner. This is the second one. And they're oh. so like two or three weeks before the show, we we're like, okay, we're gonna do this Patreon dinner. Well, let's let's call the hotel restaurant and set it up. So I call the hotel and I tell them what I'm doing. And the, the woman on the phone says, Yeah, yeah, sounds really good. You know, you're all set. Uh-oh. So about an hour goes by, and then the phone famous last words. The, the phone rings and it's Providence. So I answer it's like it's the same woman. She said, yeah um you're not all set (laughs) you're not all set my (laughs) boss is going to send you an email and work out things and we may have to have a deposit from you guys and i'm like okay fine let me know well that never happens and like a week goes by i'm like you know we have to make a decision and you know i don't know that this is going to work out you know they probably don't want us so i was like well we're just going to play it by ear but then like an hour and a half before we're actually supposed to meet, I get a text from the host, the, the, the manager saying, oh, we're ready for you and we're waiting. And, you know, you're all set for your party. Is that what happened? It's so weird. Because yeah. the, the plan was, okay, to the patrons, I sent a message to all the patrons. And I go, we're going to meet at 515 in the Biltmore, a.k.a. Guardian Lobby. And then we're going to like walk to something within two blocks that's close. Maybe that really great Mexican place or something. So then I got this text. We got this text from Pete. And I'm like, okay, in the, in the hotel where we're meeting. That, that yeah. works for me. <laughs> that works for you too. But, you know, it's sort of like 
they didn't send anything for three weeks. And then like an hour before, they're like, oh yeah, we're ready and waiting for you. It's like, what? Okay. I really enjoyed it, guys. Um, and I, I wish I could have gone out with you guys at night and everything. I, 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 uh, I I would not. I would not have passed up going to this award or no, because I love hanging out with you guys so much, and I love the atmosphere. I love the the cons, uh, but uh, it tore me up, and I I just uh, I'm still recovering, so I don't know. Maybe next time I'll drive. That might be easier <laughs> than the you planes. Can't you can't do that much cocaine anymore i mean uh, i mean you know, you know you're right you're right you know i mean you're not the man you used to be okay and yeah, once I mean, you hit 40 it's when you could do like nicholas cage and mandy just like you know snorting pyramids of cocaine off a shard of glass <laughs> i mean yes once you could do that we all remember those days mike that was crazy <laughs> stuff he, but he uh, went out drinking and then the next morning he wakes up like a 18 year old bright-eyed and bushy-tailed not one not one hangover this well, that's, gone. that's because he is basically alcohol at this point he's just <laughs> uh he's just he's like that guy remember in the lovecraft story cool air you know yes like, yes in, but instead of using refrigeration he uses alcohol he's actually pete is like like 875 years old and the alcohol is what keeps him going he showers uh, in it he's got he's got like a pump and it showers him yeah, pretty much. I mean, was... he is Lord of the Reanimator. There's got to be something in there. Oh yeah, well you know that <laughs> that, TS, that TSA guy was like, oh master, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We've uh, been waiting to meet you for so long. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was no accident. He was like, he showed him. He was like, let me, let me flash the sign. Synchronous, <laughs> synchronicity, baby, synchronicity. Uh, yeah, that Here's was simple. So... All you for every beer you drink, you drink a glass of water, and when you get back to the hotel. Before you go to bed, you take four aspirin. And by water, he means vodka. Yeah, the, the no. clear, the clear water. Yeah. The clear, the clear right, the clear right. Yeah. So my the, point, Mike, was was just that, you know, uh, Studio 54 or whatever it was, that was it was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> and, and there's just no harm in just sort of pacing yourself and saying, okay, I can't do quite that much blow. I've got to just I gotta take it back a bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely take that under advisement. I just and, want you to think about it. I just and if you, you learn nothing it. else on this program today, you know how to drink and not get a hangover because Pete just explained it to you. Or so. did he? We'll, we'll doom, see. Doom, doom. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> now you know, and and now knowing you is know. half the battle. And now knowing you know. is half the battle. G.I. Joe. Right. <laughs> That was for you, Bridget. <laughs> Thank you. I actually knew somebody who wants who would just skip over that whole, you know, the more you know, or you know, he would just say, "Oh, GI Joe," and that was it. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for being here, Rick. Congratulations once again on your on your Muncie Award, Pulp Fiction. Really, yes, well right. deserved. Yes, it is. It it, it was it was very much well deserved it was it was it was about time so um great to see you guys at necronomicon those that were there and thanks for putting on your cat ears bridget uh, <laughs> and no longer have to answer my mom saying where's bridget's cat ears why doesn't she have her cat ears on <laughs> oh, do, I, do I live with her i don't know <laughs> why is pete in bed why is pete in bed yeah are you telling me your mom <laughs> thinks that all of us live in the house with you could be. Yeah. She's going to kill me for saying this stuff. <laughs> she also said she can't stand the bronzo. Uh, she, uh, oh, mean. Uh, Get does, line. Doesn't like him. No, I'm kidding. She never said that. She never said that. I thought for sure she'd be like most of the women I've I've been, you know, I've met and hate me. But no, she's very concerned about you. You know, is Pete is Pete sickly? You know, is he okay? I'm like. Pete's fine. I'm the one that can barely walk. <laughs> Why is Pete lying in bed? And he's like, Mom, it's just because he doesn't have any legs. Really, you're anything from the waist down. He's just like a torso, Ouch. you know? Like in the film yes, version of, of Wild Wild West, Kenneth Branagh. Remember that guy? Yeah. That's now, that I've, now that I've had some fun with my mom, I will say I, I am truly so happy that she moved down here four years ago. And she's like two apartment buildings away. 
Um, and I'm glad she's here and she does help me out a lot with my illness and other stuff. So we help each other out. And thanks guys for being here. I really appreciate it. We, this was a great, great episode today. So thank you cut, cut to Mike's mom putting on the brass knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should avoid going over there for a day or two. <laughs> I think you need to bring her cookies after this. No, she'll be, she'll be too. Ha- she'll be really happy because th- of the cat ears. That's so. So you she won't so. be mad at me. I yeah, this mom. isn't for Mike. This is for you. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. All right, we're signing off. Thanks, guys, and we will see you.